five-year-old Dimitri was born with cerebral palsy. There is no medical cure for this condition. When Dimitri was born, the doctors told us he might never be able to walk, never be independent, that he would have, since this was a chronic disease, certain damage to his health that he might never recover from. We had not tried any alternative. Personally, I trusted nothing but the standard approaches. Until some people we trusted, because we knew them well, told us about Eric. We think of healing as getting up out of wheelchairs, vision returning, hearing returning, cancers disappearing, all sorts of things. And these things happen. They happen. The idea initially was just to attend a seminar that might show us some ways to help Dimitri as a family. This little boy's parents came up and said, will I do a healing session after a presentation that I gave? And I said, well, they're closing the room, but let me finish signing these books and we'll get them to keep the room open for just a little bit longer. What's wrong? And they explained he had cerebral palsy. After the seminar was completed, they met for the first time, just for a short while, about 10 or 15 minutes. There's something in cerebral palsy that's very common where your feet, instead of your feet being able to be flat on the ground, the heel was up. So his heel would not be able to touch the ground. He was scheduled for surgery for that. He had to wear supports and braces. For him to be able to get up, he'd have to hold on to furniture or people's clothing. For him to be able to go down any steps at all, he'd have to sit down on the steps and push himself down a step at a time. And to go up, he'd have to crawl on his hands and knees. We stepped on the stage with Dimitri, put him on the bed that was there, and told him that he should stay calm and collaborate with Eric, and that nothing would happen that might bother him. It was strange for us to think that this man was trying to heal him using his hands, and yet without actually touching him. He got up after four minutes and was not just walking, he was jumping and he was running. It was a huge surprise and a great joy for us. But at the same time, we were left wondering, how does this all work so fast, so directly and so effectively? He was walking properly, not standing on his tiptoes and there was no need for anyone to help him climb the stairs, which was what usually happened. Other children may naturally walk up and down the stairs every day, but Dimitri was unable to do this, so accomplishing such things is very important for him. They brought him back down for another session. He had one hand that was closed. I didn't know. He looked at me in Greek. He said, look, I can open my hand. He was just five. He said, it doesn't hurt anymore. He said, look, I can hold a glass and drink by myself. Now his fist is open. It is relaxed and cooperates with the left hand much better, which is very helpful. It's not closed into a fist, which bothered him a lot. And when he wants to give us a hug, he used to do it with only one hand. Now he gives a full hug and says, you see, I can do it. I'm a big boy now. Of course, his hand isn't fully functional yet, but together with the left hand, it works somehow, and he doesn't reject it. Perhaps the most fascinating aspect of reconnective healing is that it can be learned. Now, I didn't believe that this was something one can learn, 
I thought it was something only Eric was capable of doing. I didn't think I could acquire these skills too and help you, my neighbor, my friend. But in the course of the program, right away we saw for ourselves that yes, you can indeed learn to help others. If you see the living example standing in front of your eyes, as we see our own child, then I think that yes, you believe it. There are amazing healings taking place all the time. Yet, traditional allopathic medicine has no model or explanation for how these healings can occur. We don't understand how it is that even the simplest thing, like uh, you know, the healing from a wound that is so mundane that every child has experienced it, we don't have a full understanding of how that occurs. The answers may lie in the fundamental shift which is occurring in our understanding of our universe. Virtually every ancient culture and every native culture has thought of the universe as a unity, as a circle, and man is being central to that. And it was only with the discoveries of Isaac Newton and Rene Descartes that ripped us out of the fabric of our universe and created this clockwork model where mind is separate from body and that we are separate from each other. And that idea of separation is the foundation of Western thinking. Now Newton described a very well-behaved universe of separate things operating in space and time according to fixed laws. The idea of the body as machine, the body is this well-behaved machine with the two engines of the body being the brain and the heart, and the whole central orchestra being conducted by DNA. That's the model we have. And we think of various processes being localized in certain parts of the body. What's wrong with that is just about everything. Body is completely decentralized. There is no central brain in a sense, and that the brain is closer to a, an antenna receiver. It's closer to a transducer of information, a receiver and a transmitter of information, but not the central repository of that information. In our conventional world of uh, biochemistry and cellular biology, we focus on a Newtonian belief of a material world. Through the history of science, we focus on the mechanical reality and have let go of the concept of energy and fields uh, as information in biology. That's a Newtonian perspective that says, focus on the matter, don't pay attention to the rest of the stuff. Except that we're now recognizing that the mind, which is an energetic field of thought, which you can read with uh, EEG wires on your brain, or even more interesting is a new process called magnetoencephalograph called MEG. While electroencephalograph, you put wires on the skin and read brain activity. Magnetoencephalograph is a probe outside of the head, and it reads the fields of neural activity without even touching the body. So it basically says that when you're processing with your brain, you're broadcasting fields. 1875 to 1920 was this enormous growth of biochemistry and it was then thought that chemistry is probably, you know, we're a chemical machine. The answer is to put the right chemical in the body and you'll get better. To a point, that's correct, but it doesn't appear to be correct for chronic disease. It's correct in the short term. There was a major intellectual split going on at the time in physics because the old Newtonian world, the clockwork universe, uh, was, was going strong and a few crackpots in Denmark, Germany and to a lesser extent England developed quantum physics and said that uh, it doesn't work the way you said it works. It doesn't happen like that. And uh, there were huge anomalies found in physics that could not be explained. And the upshot of this was that the old idea of a mechanical universe, where everything happens for a specific reason in its own way, had to be dropped. Quantum physics changed our perception of reality over 80 years ago. Surprisingly, this new viewpoint has yet to be incorporated into our current biology model. The main problem with the current biological model is that it's reductionist and mechanistic. That means 
First, it tries to explain everything in terms of little bits, generally molecules, because they're the smallest things in organisms. And secondly, it tries to treat the organism as a machine that works simply in terms of physics and chemistry. Chemical reaction in the body is supposed to be central, and the main reason it occurs, according to current theory, is through molecular collision, so that one molecule collides into another, and that's how they have this information, and, and how we have a cascade of chemical processes. Now, if you think of the usual cell, a cell is like a swimming pool, and molecules are like a couple of tennis balls in that swimming pool. And according to this theory, one tennis ball is supposed to find another tennis ball in this vast body of water and do so instantaneously. And that is supposed to account for all the millions of instantaneous activities that occur in our body at every second. And that's ludicrous. The existing control system of modern medicine is enzymes, hormones. Not consciousness, not emotions, not body field. All that is there as your control system is enzymes and hormones. And uh, we find this a bit inadequate to explain uh, the whole majesty of human behavior and sickness and the whole darn thing. It's impossible. Today's medicine still works on the old paradigm of physics, which dates back to the time of Newton and the primacy of matter. Modern physics has long ago eliminated that paradigm and understands that it is not matter, but mind or spirit, which is primary. Though it isn't defined as spirit, but as energy fields, as intelligent energy fields. We look to science as some sort of absolute truth and a, a story that's already been written. But the, the reality is that Science is a story told in installments, and every new chapter oftentimes refines or completely changes what has come before. This intellectual pendulum swing, and it's swinging towards the idea of holism and looking at how an entire system works together. Whereas, you see, the doctors began to look at how each individual cell works, and they got down to the cellular level. That's all been done for a hundred years. Great, we understand it a lot. But we don't understand how the cells talk to each other and how they deal with information. When I was 15 years old, I had a very serious motorcycle accident. I was on a motorcycle I shouldn't have been on. And we were hit by a car that uh, caused a very serious wound in my leg. Um, ended up with 66 stitches. At the point of impact, I clearly remember having an out-of-body experience where my consciousness watched my body tumbling through the air and ultimately landing. And it was sort of shocking to me when I kind of came back into the body. That said to me that perhaps my consciousness isn't just in my brain, but that it, it is imbued with more quality than that. And then as I was facing a very serious outcome, they talked about the possibility of having to amputate part of my leg. I remember laying with a cast from my hip down to my ankle and thinking about how to rally my immune system through my thoughts such that I could promote healing in my leg. And so I would lay on the couch and I would visualize my immune system and I could feel it tingling. I could feel the healing happening in my leg. And I didn't come from a medical family. I have no idea at all where this idea came from. But somehow it was noetic. It came directly to me that that was what I needed to do. And ultimately they took the cast off and I'm, you know, I'm a, a two-legged creature still, thank goodness. And so I think that there was something about, you know, my own personal experience with that, that healing, um, that there was something about recognizing that my mind was important to my body and my body was important to my mind that that I just knew intuitively mind intention belief can these factors influence healing if you think you have an incurable disease if you think it yourself you are right if you think your problem is curable then you are also right it all depends on your intention 
when you think about intention, what is intention? And how does intention play a role in healing? Uh, intention plays a role when you think about how our thoughts and our emotions and our cognitions influence our immune system and our endocrine system. And we know that this happens. We know that people who feel a tremendous amount of stress, for example, have a, a, a diminished capacity in terms of their immune systems functioning. It's been discovered in the laboratory over the last 15 or 20 years, for example, that intention does have physical effects. So for example, we recently conducted a study where we recruited couples, one of whom had cancer. And we took the partner of the cancer patient and we trained them in what we called a compassionate intention program. And so they were invited in to uh, participate in a training program. A lot of it had to do with meditation, it had to do with heart opening, uh, it had to do with subtle energies. And we took them through this training program and then we asked them to go home and continue to practice this intervention for eight weeks. We brought them back and we put them in our laboratory and we monitored the patient in one room and we put them in a 2,000 pound electromagnetically shielded room so that there was no possibility of electromagnetic fields or the partner of the cancer patient talking to them on their radio, on their cell phone and saying, okay, breathe deeply now. We could rule out any of those kind of conventional explanations. Meanwhile, the partner who'd gone through the training program sat in another room and watched the image of their loved one on a closed circuit television screen. And then at random times throughout the session, they were asked to send loving, compassionate intention to the patient. The idea was to see if we could find correlations between the intention of the one person and the physiological activity of the other. What we found is that there was a significant correlation in the physiological activity of this person and the physiological activity of the other. This suggests that there is some way in which information is transferred that isn't uh, accountable by the conventional Newtonian model of cause and effect. You know, the partner of the cancer patient wasn't coming in and whispering in their partner's ear, calm down now. You know, quite the contrary. They were at a distance and there was no way that the two people knew when this kind of interaction was happening, and yet it happened. Sending an intention that I am better, sending information with belief that I am better, is sending information to the body to correct itself. Because as we say, a thought is an actual physical energy too. And it, it sends information to the body as well. It's been very well demonstrated that our belief system affects how we behave and how we perform. And it also affects our lifestyle. So if we don't believe that we can help ourselves, we probably cannot. If we don't believe that positive information is useful to our health and well-being, then it probably won't be. Our thoughts create our body moment by moment. When we think positive thoughts, we release certain chemicals into our body. When we think negative thoughts, we release negative chemicals into our body. And those have a profound effect on how the cells are behaving and how the nutrition is being used. It's very obvious to me, working as an osteopath, that um, the stress that people hold in their body has various patterns according to how they're thinking. Probably the most essential aspect of healing is to to believe in the modality you're using and to stay positive in some way. There's so much evidence about belief in a system of medicine being crucial to the effectiveness of that. I used to say to people who have cancer, after researching the limitations of things like chemotherapy, don't have chemotherapy, it only works 9% of the time. I don't do that anymore. And the reason I don't is that I believe that Belief itself is the body's strongest medicine. And if you believe something is going to work, regardless of what that is, it's going to work for you. There was a study in Houston of some patients going through a knee operation for arthritis. Half actually went through an operation where they were worked on for their arthritis. The other half were given a sham operation where they just opened the knee and then closed it and did nothing. 
They found over three years of follow-up that both sets of patients reported having no pain. So the patients where nothing was done to them still reported being pain-free. Their arthritis was gone. There have been other studies looking at if there's any difference between going to the gym and thinking about going to the gym. And with this study, they took a group of people and they sent half to the gym to work on their biceps. And the other half were allowed to sit in their armchairs and just think about going to the gym and working on their biceps. And they still recorded a very strong effect in the group who had just sat in their armchairs. The couch potatoes still built up their biceps. So the body really can't distinguish between, you know, action and thought. And you see this most clearly with the placebo effect. Traditional Western medicine typically attributes spontaneous or miraculous healing to placebo. But what exactly is the placebo effect? The placebo effect is the, the fact that a belief that a person has can override their biology. Well, it's so profoundly important that science has recognized that at least one-third of all healings, including drugs and surgery and other allopathic interventions, one-third of all healings has nothing to do with the process but has to do with the placebo effect, that a person believes that the process is going to heal them and heals themselves in spite of the fact that maybe the pill was a sugar pill or the operation was just a sham and wasn't real. And why this becomes important is this clearly one-third of all healings occurs without anybody doing anything other than having a positive thought. And what interests me as a biologist and, and former professor in a medical school is how we can talk about the placebo effect for about 15 minutes in a pharmacology course and then totally ignore the relevance of thought and mental processes on biology for the rest of medical education so that our doctors are not really using the placebo effect effectively, that we're not even studying the placebo effect. And right now we could cut the healthcare cost by exactly one third by just using the placebo effect. It seems time that we began to shift the lens and start really focusing on what is the nature of the placebo. How is it that you can take an inert substance, something that has no known um, medicinal capacity, you know, potential, and that inert substance not only can create physiological changes in the body, but actually somehow is able to manage a whole cascade of responses within a very complex system such that it can target the liver or the kidney or the lungs. You know, That is a great mystery and we don't understand that and much more needs to be done. I would say that what medicine calls the placebo effect is, by all means, an effect that is created through energy fields. As we often say, one has to believe in it, then it will work. That is correct, yet we don't think about how we actually do that every day. If, for example, we want to watch RTL, a German TV station, then we press the RTL button, which means that we go into alignment with the frequency where RTL can be received. RTL is always present, but if we don't focus on it, then we won't receive it. So, when I want to watch RTL, I have to focus on it. I have to engage in it. And here, it is the same. When I focus on something with my mind, the information follows this attention. The placebo effect is really another way of talking about the body's self-healing capacity. And anything that unleashes more of that is going to be a better system. I was absolutely desperate to have children. It was one of the reasons why I'd gotten divorced. I wanted children and my husband didn't. So I moved to London thinking it would take me a maximum of two years to find myself a, a new partner and settle down and I'd be out in the country having my 2.5 children and I'd be totally happy. That was my plan. I was very good at making plans. So there I was, I had my osteopathic practice, I was seeing clients and I was stressed, frustrated, depressed. And I had been having headaches for years, so maybe 10 years I'd been having these terrible headaches which were getting worse and worse and worse. Sometimes they lasted as long as five days. I had a routine visit with my doctor. 
And the doctor found um, that my hormone level was very much out of balance and immediately suspected that I had um, a, a tumor. So I was sent for a brain scan and they diagnosed a, a prolactinoma. It was a huge shock, huge shock, I, out of the blue. And I felt at first how unfair. Uh, I went off to the medical library and started to learn everything I could about this tumor. And when I discovered that it caused infertility, I, I thought, that is so ironic. Every cell in my body was saying, I want children. And I had somehow created a tumor that stopped me having children. There had to be some reason for this. There had to be, you know, this was too much of a coincidence, I thought. And I got very curious. Because of my alternative medicine background, I decided to treat it alternatively, rather than go for the orthodox uh, drugs or surgery. Ariel decided to utilize neuro-linguistic programming, or NLP, to approach her tumor. So then I got into doing NLP at a much deeper level. Uh, got through the master practitioner level, came home, and was totally inspired as to what I could actually do. I started to really understand what NLP was all about. NLP is a practical form of psychology, which starts from where you are now and looks at where you want to be and uncovers what's in the way. If you have, like, my five-day headaches, you know, and you'd like to be without a tumor in your end state, the journey to, to get from square one to the end square is, you know, what we actually start exploring with NLP. Ariel made some very interesting discoveries as she began working with NLP. Now, remember, I was the person who thought every cell in her body wanted children. And what I discovered was that deep down, that going back to early, early, early childhood, I had such an abhorrence of what my family had been like, that the last thing in the world part of me wanted was to, to be a mother. And this really, really shocked me. I, th I thought I wanted one thing, and in fact, an unconscious part of me was going in a completely different direction. And when I understood the reasons why it didn't want children and what it was based on, I was able to kind of let go of that and, and allow it to be the way it was, and at least to understand why I'd created a life that didn't go down that path. One day, I heard myself shouting inside my head. It was like this little voice saying, I'm so sick of this. I just want to be rid of this whole nightmare. I want to be rid of this tumor. And I stopped in shock as I listened to this voice inside my head, and I went, wow, there's a lot of anger in there a lot of frustration, that's a lot of self-attack. If I'm attacking my tumor with all those thoughts of wanting to get rid of it, that's murderous. That can't be healing. And I had never looked at healing in that way. And I realized then that every thought I'd had was actually about making it go away. Now, it, it, that's a conflict. That's a huge inner conflict. And I decided to look at that a little bit more closely. And I thought, well, what would be the opposite? It has to be acceptance. I thought to myself, well, what would it be like if I really accepted this tumor? And this was quite a few years later, but it was, it was absolutely a, a, a turning point in my healing when I realized that my tumor had taken me down a journey I'd never planned. It had taught me things I had never intended to learn. I had changed my career, I had changed my whole outlook, I had learned lots of things about myself and others, I had insights I'd never had before. I'd met amazing people, wonderful people all over the world. I'd had the support of people all over the world. And I realized I liked myself a lot better. And so I thought, okay, I can see that this tumor hasn't been totally bad. What if it has a purpose or a reason for being here? Because obviously it's done a good job so far. So if it's got a purpose for being here and it's still here, maybe there's still a purpose. What, it, what would happen if I gave it permission to stay for the rest of my life? It was six months after I had that realization and I got to the point of accepting 
the presence of my tumor. I had my routine blood test and went to see my specialist. And um, to my surprise, my hormone levels were completely normal. And when my doctor saw them, he just went, wow, that's incredible. And, you know, I thought it had been a mistake. I thought maybe the blood test reading was wrong or something. I said, well, you know, so much time has passed and I'm older now. Maybe my hormones have changed. He said, no, 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 can't be that. He said, this can only mean one thing. Your tumor has gone. And he said, uh, this is a real credit to you. I don't know how you've done it. I don't know what you've been doing. Um, but I have to tell you, I've seen you for 10 years and you're not the same person you were 10 years ago. You are completely different. So when we make an emotional shift, let's say we go from frustration to joy, those kind of emotional shifts, about 1,400 biochemical changes instantly go off in the body. Now, if you think about the course of one day, all the emotions that we feel, the highs and the lows, and you know, the myriad of emotional textures that uh, occur through our perceptions you know, during a day, you can see that, that emotions are creating lots and lots of changes in our physiology. So it makes a lot of sense to start paying attention to the emotional diet as well as to the physical diet. That's one of the keys to better health and certainly to slowing down the aging process. Um, Strong negative emotions just degenerate us. Positive emotional states regenerate us. Become simple math. Feel more love, more care, more appreciation, and your health's got a better chance of improving and staying that way. One of the most profound discoveries made really since the advent of quantum physics is a thing called the zero point field. And what this is, is the energy exchange that goes on between subatomic particles. All subatomic particles engage in a little energy dance. It's almost like a, playing a game of basketball. They send energy back and forth to each other. And in that exchange, a thing called a virtual particle is created just for less than the blink of an eye. Now, that little individual exchange isn't much energy. It's about a half a watt's worth. But when you multiply all of the subatomic particles doing this energy exchange across all things in all the universe, you come up with this unfathomable amount of energy, all happening out there in empty space, like some supercharged backdrop. While conventional biology focuses on the material stimuli, quantum physics reveals that it's the invisible stimuli that are much more important. There's a simple quote by Albert Einstein that makes sense out of this, and the quote is, the field is the sole governing agency of the particle. What Einstein meant by this very simply is the field, the invisible energy forces around us, uh, they are the sole governing agencies of the particle. Well, the particles matter. And so quantum physics says the character of matter is ultimately determined by the field. How then? is healing communicated to another person. Well, you see, there's this field. We're not in this field, we are this field. We're denser, we're lighter in between, we're denser, we're lighter in between, or some people say we're lighter when we're physical form and we're denser in between. Whatever the aspect is, we're blips in this field, this field of energy, of light, of information. We access this field all the time. We pull information from this field all the time. Every one of us has watched a flock of birds in flight and how it changes direction. Instantly, all birds in the flock change direction. So, it seems as if a superior bird brain controls all the birds simultaneously. That only works with the help of those fields, since the fields are able to transfer with no informational loss, and above all, instantaneously, with no time delay. Walk into any Greek cathedral in the United States, in Europe, anywhere, that's been standing for a hundred years or more. And what you will experience is in that cathedral is a hush of awe, reverence, quiet, and it's a palpable experience. Why is that true? It is true because for hundreds of years, the people going into that cathedral 
have been on their best behavior. They have been in awe and worshipful and in a state of mind that the quantum emissions from the body brain are emitted into that cathedral, absorbed into that cathedral, and fed back in later centuries to the participants coming into it. And that's why they feel a sense of hush, awe, and reverence. We're all part of this giant energy field, this zero-point field, that we're all connected, and that we're connected across the furthest reaches of the cosmos. Watch an ice skater. There are things that they can do that are not describable in terms of nerve impulses. Nerve impulses and chemical reactions are too slow to explain the subtleties of life. Even now, if you look up the textbooks in psychology, in medicine or biology, and try to find out how the nervous system works, you're confronted with the discontinuity of the system. The nervous system is comprised of neuron cells that carry electrical and chemical impulses throughout the body. If you measure the impulses of the nervous system, we get some of them going at 200 miles an hour, whereas other of them going at two miles an hour, and I think those of the pain reflexes are, are very slow. How on earth the brain or any other part of the body can coordinate the nervous system and, and your very fine movements when these impulses are, are supposed to be traveling at many different speeds is just an impossible problem. If you're a dancer, for example, we're moving in three dimensions and you're moving in time. How on earth that person can coordinate all of these important dance steps is quite a mystery. This seems to be impossible with the contemporary model of the nervous system. We need a field theory to explain how the nervous system in all its complexity can coordinate everything that happens in the body. We now know when you study nervous system activity that the brain can start firing synchronous pulses throughout different areas of the brain virtually instantaneously. The significance of these coherence of these pulses that begin to fire when actually consciousness is functioning is when scientists looked at how fast you could coordinate all these different areas that were focusing at the same time, that the coherence of the firing was faster than the physical ability of cells to communicate from one area to the other. So basically, these results reveal that the brain is communicating on a higher level than through the physical transmission of nerves. Our brains also don't work the way we were taught in school. Learning isn't here, memory isn't here, speech isn't here, this isn't there, this isn't somewhere else. These aspects are diffuse throughout our brains, and we access it from the field. So it's as if there's this bandwidth of information that we're always in tune with, although not always consciously. We're understanding that the brain doesn't have precise addresses for certain things. No one's been able to find where memory is, for instance. And Carl Pribram did some amazing studies years ago, um, horrible studies, where they taught rats certain runs and then began systematically destroying the rat's brains. And they found that no matter how much of the brain they removed, the rats might have terrible motor skills from that, but they would still, over and over, remember the run. And from that, Pribram understood that you couldn't say that memory has one precise address, that it's much more delocalized. And in fact, most radically, that memory might not exist inside the skull at all, but maybe somewhere out here in the field. And so what you have instead of this localized, centralized system is much more of a paradigm where the body is an interaction. It's not something that ends here, it's something that ends out here. And that we have an interaction taking place between us and our environment, us and the field at every moment. I had an irregularity on a kidney that was discovered by an MRI. The physicians wanted to operate, biopsy that, and I said, no, we're not gonna do that. 
And I had a healer, Adam, a young man in Vancouver, who was developing his talents as a healer. He wanted to work on it. Over a period of a month, we did that once a week. Using just a photograph, Adam can perceive a person's body field in the form of a holographic image. He sees areas where the energy flow is blocked, which indicates illness or injury. Through his intention to heal, he manipulates energy and information to clear these blockages, allowing the body to change. I went back and had a sonogram made of that a month after diagnosis. The radiologist examined the data and said, whatever you're doing, keep doing it, that the irregularity in the kidney is smaller and disappearing. Went back three months after that, in, uh, early, later in 2003, after that, uh, where the total healing period had been less than six months, and again had sonogram, and it was totally gone. Everything was regular again. Nearly all of the healings that I have worked with have been remote or at a distance. And it doesn't seem to make... The distance has, seems to have no effect at all, which would again suggest we're dealing with a quantum phenomena. The healer was in Vancouver, British Columbia. I was in Florida, the longest distance across the United States. Because I've continued then to experiment with different healing modes for different things with different people. But the mechanism is always the same. There's information being uh, uh, transferred. And there seems to be an energy transfer as well that's palpable. It now appears that our bodies are connected to the field. But what is the mechanism for this intercommunication? How can this connection take place? One possible solution, the biophoton. Biophotons are weak emissions of light emanating from the cells of all living things. We know we're sending out information with biophoton emissions because people like Fritz Pop have discovered that we are sending out tiny currents of light. We started to look for these photons. I knew from the beginning on that it must not be very high intensity, but it was clear that uh, one should have these photons at all in a cell. In order to detect the biophotons, Professor Pop and his students needed a photomultiplier that was so sensitive it could see a candle over 12 miles away. When a living organism is placed in front of the photon detector, light emitting from the cells can be observed. We started with cucumber seedlings and later with other ones and uh, all uh, living systems which we put into the instrument showed uh, this very weak photon emission. Professor Pomp theorizes that these biophoton emissions may be controlling our body's metabolism. Molecules cannot regulate themselves. They have to have a field more or less. So the photons should be the carrier of the information which is necessary to regulate the metabolism. These biophotons create a dynamic, coherent web of light within our bodies. Our bodies are constantly emitting light in the form of biophotons. Are these biophotons the body's control mechanism? Isn't that the function of our DNA, our genes? Genes are not controlling our biology. When we get issues running in families, for example, cancer, we immediately look at a genealogy chart and mark all the recipients of this cancer running through the family and then turn around and say, look, genetics, this is running in the family, so there must be cancer genes. What they've left out of this very interesting piece of research that reveals that when children are adopted, into families that have cancer, the adopted children will express the cancer with the same propensity as any natural child in that family. But the interesting fact is the child comes from totally different genetics that doesn't even have that cancer. So it says being introduced into the family dynamics, which is where you learn perceptions and beliefs and attitudes, is what shapes the cancer, not the genetics that somebody came in with. 
there is a new branch of genetics known as epigenetics that addresses this environmental influence on genetic expression. Epigeneticists have discovered that the information inside every cell, the thing that, that switches it on and turns it on and, and changes things, is not inside the cell, but outside. Signals occur outside from the environment. A gene is a blueprint, that's basically what it is, to make a protein molecule. And the proteins, there are over 100,000 of them, are the building blocks that give us our, our biology, our structure, our behavior. Okay? So the issue is, we talk about gene blueprints, and up until the last 10 years, a blueprint was a hard-wired piece of information to make a particular protein. The new science is just mind-boggling because it reveals that through epigenetic mechanisms, through the influence of the environment on reading the genes, epigenetic mechanisms can produce over 30,000 different variations from every gene blueprint. And all of a sudden, when you start to recognize that, you realize we have potentials that are totally unlimited. And this is a great change from a belief that genes were deterministic. Now, genes are potentials. If you just look at the molecular level, uh, the Human Genome Project has revealed that we have about 25,000 genes, far fewer than they originally expected. The Chimpanzee Genome Project has now sequenced the entire chimpanzee genome, and their genome is virtually the same as ours. They've got the same kinds of proteins, the same kind of genes. You can hardly tell the difference. Yet, there's an obvious difference, and if you can't explain it in terms of genes, what can you exp explain it in terms of? And the answer is, I think, morphogenetic fields. Just as you can build two different buildings with the same bricks and cement, if you have two different plans, uh, you can build different organisms with different fields, even if the constituent molecules are very similar as they are in humans and chimpanzees. The DNA is like a library book. These are all the possible proteins from earthworms right up to us. It's all the same library, but you've got to know which book to take out of the library. This is the big problem in genetics itself, is trying to explain how the body knows which book to take out of the genetic library. And we think the body field is what decides which piece of information is taken from the DNA. Many cultures of the past have explored the energetic system of the body. Today, researchers theorize that the body does have a field of energy known as the morphogenic field or the body field. There's a hierarchy of fields organizing our bodies. There's the field of the whole body, there's the fields of the organs, and then the fields of the tissues, and then the fields of the cells within those field of our own body is within and around the body. There's an overall field and then there's subsidiary fields, sort of modular fields for arms, legs and the different organs. The advantage of fields is that they're intrinsically holistic. All fields are holistic. The gravitational field is. You can't slice a bit out of it. If you cut a flatworm into ten different pieces, each part can grow into a new worm. Now how is that possible? If it was a machine, uh, that wouldn't happen. If you cut up a machine, all you get is a broken machine. Um, but if you cut up a magnet, a field system, then you, however many little bits of magnet you produce, each has a complete magnetic field. And it was this analogy with magnetic fields that led developmental biologists to suggest the idea of morphogenetic fields in the first place. And this was way back in the 1920s. And this field is now a crucial concept in developmental biology. You can't really understand how organisms develop without it. All humans begin life as a single cell that grows and divides, developing into the various organs and limbs of our bodies. How these cells know what to become has baffled scientists and led to the idea of control fields in biology. We've already found that there are different parts of the body field, some of which relate to the muscles and connective tissue. Another part of the body field that relates to the brain and nervous system, uh, yet another one for the morphic field which connects back to the DNA and the genetic information of your body. 
So it links up with medicine in many places. So it's not different from medicine. It's just going a little bit further conceptually. These energetic fields may provide the information necessary for controlling the body. How does the body know to maintain its temperature at a particular temperature? What decides or who decides what is going to be the correct blood pressure for that person? Nobody knows. And we're saying, as a holistic idea, the body field decides to tune, turn all the knobs. Morphogenetic fields, or more generally fields of information, yes, are control systems over and above the molecular level or um, the biochemical level. They're systems that organize the body, they organize the developing organism. Plants have them too, animal, all animals have them. Um, they maintain the form of the body. They help bodies to recover from disease or damage. They underlie regeneration, for example. We could go even further and could say that the human body actually is structured information. Or in other words, that the human body is an energy field. An energy field of standing, stationary, scalar waves that are correspondingly organized, structured, and contain a great deal of information. And I think that we really need a field-based model of the body if we're ever going to be able to integrate different forms of healing or medicine into a coherent uh, understanding. The body field is an energetic field filled with patterns of information. All of the organs in our bodies generate their own specific fields. One organ in particular seems to generate significant fields which affect the entire body. The heart is the emperor in the system. The liver uh, and all the organs have other tasks, but the heart is overruling all. There's a concept in energy medicine called energy cardiology that says that the signals produced by the heart are all of regulatory importance. The heart is constantly emitting sound, pressure waves, heat, light, electrical, magnetic, and electromagnetic signals. All of the cells in the body are receiving these different kinds of signals at different times because they travel at different velocities through the circulatory system. The heart generates by far the largest rhythmic electromagnetic signal in the body. If you look at the, this magnetic field as a carrier wave, it's being modulated with information. So it's the carry away for information. And the work in our lab has shown quite clearly that it's modulated with emotional patterns. In other words, if we're feeling angry or frustrated, irritated, the information that's being imprinted on that magnetic field is very different than if we're feeling care or love or compassion towards that person. The heart has been found to have rhythmic beating patterns that can be incoherent or coherent. These patterns are closely linked to our emotions and how we feel. When the heart's rhythmic beating pattern is smooth and ordered, it's called a coherent rhythm. And that coherent rhythm entrains or synchronizes the brain rhythm, the nervous system, the bodily organs and glands all dance in harmony to that heart coherent rhythm. Positive emotions, what we tend to call positive, Things like love, appreciation, care, forgiveness, gratitude, all lead to a very different kind of heart pattern than negative things. Like if we're feeling anger, or irritation, anxiety, uh, those create what are called uh, incoherent rhythms or disordered patterns. On the other hand, we have the positive feelings when we're just appreciating the sunset and how beautiful it is. Our heart's beating out this what we call coherent rhythm. It's a sine wave-like pattern that uh, the, the heart is sending to the brain. And we call it heart coherence because in research we find that the heart has to get into this synchronized, coherent, rhythmic pattern of heart rate in order for the rest of the brain and the nervous system and body to entrain and synchronize to that powerful rhythm. So it starts with the heart. When we feel the pulse, what we're feeling is the pressure wave created by the beating heart. It's not actually the flow of blood, it's the, the pressure wave. So every time the heart beats, that pressure wave goes to the brain and throughout the body. 
And it, if we look at the brain level, that pressure wave synchronizes all the neurons. In fact, the brain would be in trouble if it didn't have that synchronizing signal uh, to kind of give us a global synchronizing effect. When someone is in coherence, you can often feel their love or their compassion or their gratitude radiating. Coherence is the optimal physiological state that underlies learning and performance and uh, facilitating the body's natural regenerative processes. The heart has its own intrinsic nervous system, which can sense, feel, remember, and process information that's independent from the brain. We always think of the information input system as being entirely in the brain. But we're now discovering information that the heart receives information first and then relays it to the brain. Studies have shown that the heart responds faster than the brain to outside stimulation. One of the more recent studies we did in our labs was looking at the, what we ended up titling the electrophysiology of intuition. There was some previous research that had been done showing that the body would respond in a way that would predict a future event if the future event was emotionally significant and relevant to the person. Participants were attached to sensors to record their brainwave activity, heart activity, and heart-brain interactions. A person would be sitting in a computer, push a button, and then we're recording physiological data, and six, eight seconds later, you would be shown a, a photograph. Okay, and then the photograph would be from two opposite ends of the spectrum of emotional arousal. Participants were shown pictures of car accident victims, snakes attacking, and other disturbing images. On the other end of the spectrum, the pictures included flowers or sunsets. The photographs were randomly assigned for display to the participants. What's key here is the computer assigned not only which photograph, but which type of photograph after the data was already recorded. So it was absolutely impossible for the research subject, the experimenter, to have any kind of foreknowledge of what photograph it might be. The computer itself didn't even know. The results were surprising. The body responded even before the picture was displayed. What we found was that not only did the body indeed respond prior to the event, you know, the scene, the picture, in, in a way that would predict it, but it was the heart that responded first. The heart's response was not only faster, but the signal it sent to the brain varied depending on the emotional content of the picture. Looking at the signals that the heart was sending to the brain, that the heart literally sent a different message to the brain, depending on what the future picture was going to be. Then you saw a brain response. Then you saw the body response, which is where it then became conscious. So the flow of, of this in, uh, what, intuitive information is heart, brain, body, and then you have to have the body response for it to become consciously aware of it. What these experiments reveal is changing our basic understanding of how the human body functions. It appears as though the heart and brain, later, have access to a field of information not bound by time and space. If we're talking kind of quantum holographics or quantum physics, that's old news. So we're really starting to have ways now of showing that we really do have a, an energetic or an electronic system. And um, that that's really primary, that it's really not bound by time and space. The heart is connected to a field of information and intelligence that's different but complementary to the field of the brain. It's very clear these neurons in the heart and the brain part uh, have short and long-term memory. They process information. It's a functional brain. Other researchers theorize that the heart may be the master organ for imprinting information into the body field. There's a lot of neural tissue in the heart, and we believe that neural tissue is there in order to act as an imprinter for the hologram. The body's holographic body field is continually supplied with information via the pressure waves of the heart. Inside the heart, there is an enormous amount of charge. Now, the pressure waves in the presence of this charge inside the chamber of the heart is sufficient to imprint information. If the heart is transmitting or imprinting information, there must be a way for the cells in the body to receive that information. 
there are receptor protein cells on the outside of the cell which are simply there to, re to receive environmental information. How is my day today? What is going on out there? What does the body want this little cell to do today? You see what I mean? There has to be uh, intercellular communication, but there has to be one source so there can be one control system for the body. This control system is sending out information to the body via the body field. But what exactly is information? If we think of the body as uh, a, both a material and an energetic, dynamically exchanging open system, which it is, we need to eat like a ton of food a year and most of it is passed out. So uh, it, all of that food is somehow turned into the body, which remains extremely stable for long periods of time. Somebody basically doesn't change much for maybe 40 years as an adult. People recognize you immediately even 40 years later because the basic body structure doesn't change even though after a short period of time you don't have a single atom left in your body. They've all exchanged and, and gone out. And, and so now this is, this is the hamburger I ate yesterday and you know, in three weeks from now this will be a carrot that I eat tomorrow and so on. It, it's a very dynamic system and yet I remain the same. So if it's not the material, and presumably not the energetic part, the dynamic energetic part, then what's left? There must be something like an informational pattern which holds it together. Many scientists who are on the frontier theorize that and have demonstrated that we're an information system and it's not entirely localized in our body, that we're accessing information from the field all the time. The body appears to be constantly connecting with information within itself and with information in the field. The body is always looking for coherent systems, looking for information interchange between all cells he has, so that every single cell knows what's on. It's a large information system, and uh, some people say that illness is just a, a lack in the information system, and I suppose they are right. Matter is compressed energy. Information is patterns of energy. There's an information flow in our bodies that we still don't completely understand through our nervous system and through the tissues. And even the ancients, some of the ancients and the Chinese call it the acupuncture system, which is a system of information flow in the body itself. We get a system when we get structure. You know, there's information everywhere, isn't there? But you only get an information system when it's ordered. And the great thing that was discovered in the 1980s was that the acupuncture system appears to be an organized system. It's not just a random group of acupuncture meridians. It looked, uh, upon doing experiments, that they wanted to arrange themselves in a certain order and that they wanted to communicate with each other in a certain direction. So we're saying that information has order, and that's what makes the body feel, is the order itself. The actual regulation of the whole organism and of all cells, the coordination of all cells, is accomplished with the help of these information fields, these scalar wave fields. They guarantee that each cell knows what every other cell is doing at any given time, and we have over 70 trillion cells. This is a lot of information and it can only be processed with the help of these structured fields. Ultimately, according to Einstein and other people more recently, have said that energy and information must be interchangeable. All right. So information becomes a type of energy because it's, a, it's an orderliness in space. All right. So they are interchangeable, but on the other hand, in practice what happens is you get a wave of energy and then upon that wave you can get imprinted information. And the amount of information you can imprint appears to be limitless. Informational medicine, medicine that takes information and changes disturbed information is going to be the future of medicine. Apparently, the control system of the body is not genes or chemistry, but information, which seems to be available in the body field. Is it possible to put new information into the body to affect wellness? 
that is exactly what a number of researchers are doing. That we've learned how to stop the distortion of information that occurs as a result of various disease processes. Once you stop the distortion, surprisingly enough, the physiology begins to work, the chemistry comes right, there are really wonderful healing stories to be told here. And it's simply because we've learned how to correct the distortion of information in your body field. Disease is, in a sense, scrambled information. And so if we can access the appropriate information, we correct the scrambling. And that's what a number of, of these new energy modalities are doing. They're basically correcting that information scrambling. That's what I've done too. I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer when I was 20, which resulted in having to have surgery and they removed all but a fourth of my thyroid gland. I've had to take a uh, synthetic hormone to give me the thyroid hormone that I needed ever since. I was uh, diagnosed with uh, chronic fatigue syndrome some years later and fibromyalgia some years later, which, you know, I just continued to get sicker and sicker. My husband had to pick me up out of the bed if I had to get up. He had to feed me, set me up in the bed and feed me. It, it got really bad to the point is where um, pretty much so bathe her and carry her from the bed to the bathroom and things of this nature just to, just to, for her to survive on a daily basis. They really um, didn't know what to do for that type of, of illness. I was pretty much told that you just kind of had to live with it. I couldn't help her, you know, and no matter what she told me, what hurt or what felt bad or what was happening, I couldn't help her and neither could anybody else, we didn't think. My doctor finally said, Vanessa, you know, I really don't know what to do for you at this point. All I can do is try to give you medicines to make you more comfortable. But I would suggest that you um, go see this nutritionist and maybe she could help you figure out what you can eat or at least, you know, you can start to get some nutrients from something. Vanessa actually was referred to me by her endocrinologist. When she first came to me, she was literally not able to spend a day at all out of the bed. Uh, she had lost a tremendous amount of weight. She was allergic to almost everything. I was having a lot of trouble finding any foods that I could eat at all which really resulted in me being so weak. The inside of her mouth was, had a lot of sores inside of it. The uh, lips had uh, multiple sores on them, like a cold sore type thing. And her hair was like straw and coming out. The first thing I did was the nest testing. The system is designed to determine areas of distortion in the body field. New information is made available to the body by ingesting drops that have been imprinted with an information pattern. I started her out at the dosing that we would have addressed a child because her energy fields were that weak. So we uh, started out very, very cautiously. One morning I woke up after I had been seeing uh, Deborah probably for a couple of months and I just had this feeling that I hadn't ever had. And I knew, I knew that, that this was the answer. And I felt so good that I just cried. I just sat up in the middle of my bed and I just cried and cried and cried. In about six months, she reached an energy level of where the body was beginning to transfer message more effectively to where the, every layer that we went through, she was uh, showing remarkable uh, health changes. Being from a man's standpoint and a Southern country boy type person is how I grew up. I first thought it was hocus pocus, you know, and I had my doubts and it took a while, but I see now that it, it's, it's phenomenal. It truly is. I've become healthy enough to what I think is living a normal life again. 
because now I can clean my own house. I can cook my meals. I can even work in the yard. I can even wash my car. I can do things that I never thought I would ever be able to do again. It's 180 degrees from where it was. It's just a total turnaround. It really is. I really don't know how to explain the difference in the way I feel. It's like I died and I come back to life. And I never thought that I would ever feel this way again. I got my life back. I got my life back. And it's wonderful. We're on the threshold of an entire new understanding of how disease happens, how information is transferred, and how to enhance information transfer within living systems. There's a vast increase in chronic disease in our community, and I believe using these information uh, methods that we can treat the chronic disease that couldn't be treated before. One of the most remarkable instances of the effectiveness and the instantaneous effect of informational medicine uh, I heard about recently, and it had to do with this system called thought field therapy, which is an energy psychology that supposedly heals and changes negative thoughts around us. And the theory is that negative thoughts hang around us almost like a net, and they affect bodily systems. They used this system in Kosovo with survivors of the war in former Yugoslavia. These were families who had been severely traumatized because the Serbs had killed half of a family just so their survivors would be demoralized. So they took a group of people who had severe post-traumatic stress syndrome who would have required years and years and years of talking cures and medicine and all that sort of conventional thinking. And they gave them thought-filled therapy. And to a person, this is 100% of the people in this study were made virtually instantly better to the point where they were laughing, joking. They were healed completely from this trauma. Even the practitioners of energy psychology were blown away by the power of this modality. But this just gives us one small example of the power of using information as medicine. So the most important thing for people to do is to take total responsibility for their health. Not to think that it comes from outside themselves or that somebody else can give it to them. And by taking total responsibility, that may mean they, they have to start with choosing the thoughts that they think so that they are in a good state of mind, the state of mind that's most conducive to healing. One of the fundamental things that has to change in the future of medicine is this focus on the gene as being the solution to every illness. If you look at what epigeneticists are coming up with, you have an understanding that the gene is really subordinate to this outside information system and that we have to look at information rather than the gene as being the thing that we have to crack, so to speak. We have to come up with information systems that regularize the things that go wrong. I think there is absolutely no question that healthcare today at a global level is in crisis. And it's a crisis of meaning, it's a crisis of economics, it's a crisis of leadership, uh, and it's a crisis of our models and our understanding of what promotes or facilitates healing. We do things like we have a war on cancer. We try to destroy invading organisms. It's a warfare model of health and disease and how to treat disease. And the body really doesn't go for that. We have to learn from other cultures, from other traditions, from the observations of all the different kinds of healers that are working in our own cultures at the moment. We have to take the best of modern science and use it to integrate what's going on. What we need to do is foster a revolution that shifts our model from a disease-centered orientation to a healing-centered orientation. And once you begin to make that move, you are 
you know, responsive to a variety of different factors that can facilitate or enhance our natural healing capacities. I think we can rightly say the revolution has begun, not just in, in my case. There are research workers all around the world who are thinking much the same and who have research data that we can incorporate into these new ideas of the body field. But I think now we have a viable scientific theory for how the body stores and accesses information. So we do have a medical revolution on our hands. There seems to be this huge body of evidence demonstrating that we can pick up information um, that almost like an electron, we can be everywhere at once. So I would say what healing is, is learning to correct the human body field so that it works according to the original blueprint. So ultimately what I'd like to see is, is a shift from this disease-centered to this healing-centered model and recognizing that healing is a profound mystery and that we have so much to learn. And rather than presuming we have the answers, staying open to the possibility that there are new things that we can discover for how to enhance the human condition. The mind is the functioning of the brain that interprets the environment and adjusts the biology. So rather than being controlled by our genes, our biology is controlled by our mind. And when you understand this and you realize the power of being able to change your mind, because when you do that, you change your biology and your genetics. If someone's sick, they don't want to know whether pill X works better than a placebo in a double-blind trial. What they want to know is what's the best kind of treatment. I believe that we are more powerful than we realize. I believe that many of the medical techniques that we're finding to be very successful, people can do on themselves once they understand their own energetics. It's very clear that negative information is deleterious, or that you, if you accept it into your body and into your belief system, it will change the way you react and change your state of health. We know that from work by William Tiller and others, we found that when you begin to work with reconnective healing, there's an amount of, I believe he calls it, excess free thermodynamic energy that is released. That if this were just energy or just energy healing instead of the reconnection, for this amount to be released and this change to happen in people, it would require that the room temperature rises over 300 degrees centigrade, which of course does not happen because we're accessing something new and something different. And coherence is the natural resonant state of the human body. In other words, we, we do have, us humans, we have a resonant frequency. Okay? 
And it's, it's also what we call the coherent state. So a miracle starts with a change of thinking. It's like when I changed my thinking about my tumor and I decided it was my best friend and my guide rather than it being the worst thing that had ever happened to me. Um, that was the miracle. When I gave it permission to stay to the end of my days, that was the miracle. People think it's the end result, but it's not the end result. It's the change of thinking which leads to a completely different inner state. You need both. You need to, the will to be healed and the good information from a therapist, from infraceuticals, whatever. Yes, of course, this, this has to come together, this has to match. So healing is uh, restoring the body's own self-repairing mechanisms. And that's the biggest thing as a doctor you can achieve, that you can help uh, your patients with restoring their own repairing mechanisms. <laughs> 